En Vinos y Placeres tenemos el privilegio de hablar con una figura clave en el crecimiento del vino argentino en el Reino Unido, conversando con Phil Crozier sobre el posicionamiento de nuestros vinos en ese país. ¡Bienvenidos! Phil, welcome to Argentina again. Thank you. Lovely to be here. I've not been here since 2019. Ah. So yeah, I'm missing Argentina badly. And <laughs> it's been fantastic, the trip so far. And what are you doing now? Um, I, uh, I was uh, running Wines of Argentina in Europe for a few years after I left Gaucho in 2018. Mm -hmm. And um, I invested in a small company with yeah. a friend of mine. Mm -hmm. um, and we thought that we'd um, rather than just marketing wine and actually put our money where our mouths are and started um, importing wine from Argentina. So we have a few brands, small wineries. We specialize in small, uh, very terroir led wineries. Mm -hmm. um, we sell in the UK market. So we mostly sell to <coughs> small independent wine merchants and restaurants. Um, and we've just been uh, trading for two years and it's going very well. Mm -hmm. You know very well this market now. Pardon? You know? Uh, yes, I do. Yes. Uh, um, well, I mean, I've known the market for many years. Is uh, I was partly responsible for for um, Argentina in the UK because in 1999 I was working for the Gaucho Group. Mm -hmm. We had um, we just opened our fourth restaurant um, in the city of London, which was wildly successful. Um, this was at a time when people in the city were. Um, They like to go out and drink at lunchtime and have a good meal at lunchtime and doing deals. So um, uh, I decided that um, we were going to take the wine list to be 100% Argentine because all the beef that we bought was from Argentina. We were very much wanted to reflect the culture of Argentina. Um, and there were only 13 wineries available in the UK market in 1999. Mm. And so I was ringing all of the importers <laughs> and saying, do you do anything from Argentina? I had all these samples um, and I have to say, I didn't know very much about wine then. So I had to rely on a few people to help me. I started learning very quickly because I came to Argentina that same year. Um, and I think I fell in love with the country and I fell in love with the culture and I fell in love with the mountains over there, which are so beautiful. And um, over the years, I, I started um, producing this wine menu and finding ways in which to curate the menu mm. to be easy to understand for, for our guests and for our staff to be able to sell the wines. And it, and it occurred to me that we have to find things that are very unique about the country. So the first thing I did was to start listing the wines by grape variety. Mm -hmm. And each of the wines that I listed by grape variety, I'd go from north to south. And then I would put the altitude of each of the vineyards underneath the wine and also say where it's from. Mm -hmm. Now, a lot of people would say that was a strange thing to do back then because most people didn't even know Argentina made yes. wine. Okay. So, but I started and thought we need to start with an intent. Mm -hmm. We need to say, um, We need to start talking about the regions. We need to start talking about the altitude because in 10 years time, it'll become much more clear as hopefully the market for Argentina increases in the UK. So um, we started at a very premium level. Mm -hmm. um, I think Argentina in the UK started at a very premium level. It didn't go into the supermarkets. There was virtually nothing mm -hmm. in the supermarkets. And at that time, no one was really aware for, of Malbec unless it was from Cahors in France. And it wasn't called Malbec, it was called Cot. So yes. Malbec, in our language, yes. did not exist as mm -hmm. a word. So then we started um, getting these Malbecs and of course I was going to and from Argentina once or twice a year and it became very clear as the market in Argentina was becoming also more, more complex and more geared towards 
Malbec and producers were becoming, you know, Catena of course famously went Malbec instead of Cabernet Sauvignon. So the rest of the industry followed. And so in 2006, I produced a wine list, two wine lists, one with every grape variety, and I had a separate wine list that I called the Super Malbec Club. <laughs> yeah. Um, with a little bit of a tongue in cheek, you know, Super Malbec Club. But these were very terroir focused Malbecs that mm -hmm. were now becoming available in the market. So again, I went from north to south and talked about altitude and how it affected the grape. In 2008, we bought our first vineyard. So we bought a vineyard in Lulunta, mm -hmm. um, a very old vineyard on Calle Terrara. Mm -hmm. um, you know that whole region is very old. <laughs> and we started producing our own Malbec and Mauricio Loco was making the wines for us. Yes, great in that. Yeah, and um, occasionally we would ask another winemaker to make, pick some uh, grapes from a plot that they liked. So Roberto de la Mota, who was next door at Mendel, mm -hmm. also made a wine for us. And, we had a couple of brands and they were our biggest selling wines. Ya seguimos conversando con Phil Crozier en Vinos y Placeres. Continuamos conversando con Phil Crozier del cambio de estilo del vino argentino. You see the, the change of style in the in the analogies of the wines? Huge, huge changes. I mean, when I look back, when I first started, and, and in a way, my naivety, the fact that I didn't know very much about wine, mm -hmm. was perhaps um, a real blessing. Because some of the wines were not very good. Yes. They were over-extracted, they were, they were over-oaked, they were over-ripe. Um, often oxidized mm -hmm. and over time the winemaking changed and over time that was great because I realized and over time Argentina realized also that they needed to reflect their place mm -hmm. and I think one of the great things about the analogy in Argentina I think that is that there are a number of winemakers and a number, a number of uh, in, influential uh, wineries have found their place so for example here Aritemisque, they are San Jose, and they are um, they are they are Tupungato. Yes, and we know we need to start talking about Tupungato. Then we need to start talking, of course, about the Uco Valley, mm -hmm. as opposed to Luján or Maipú. Then you've got to break it down even more and start talking about what is the difference between Tupungato, Tunajan, and San, and and then even then we have to start talking about all the subregions within mm -hmm. Raquel Altamira, all the IGs what's happening with that. I think that's been very positive for Argentina. And now, you know, we're, we're doing that even, we're breaking that down even more. You know, so for example, we talk about Walter Jari. I mean, we're not going to be able to have an mm -hmm. IG for Walter Jari. So we'll have Monasterio, we'll have all these, it'll be broken up even more. And I think a lot of that links with altitude again, but it links with the soils. And I think perhaps mm -hmm. the greatest change in the last 25 years in Argentina has been the knowledge of the soils and the history of the geology of, um, of Argentina. And, mm -hmm. and being able to interpret that. And the only way you can interpret that is by picking earlier, mm. is by using less oak and less extraction. And so that's, this is and also the other thing, white wine, for me, yes. it's been a revelation. There have been a number <laughs> of producers, you know, who, who now produce world-class Chardonnay, Semillon, which I think should be Argentina's grape. Yes. Historically, it is. Mm -hmm. 
um, and of course Torontes and the Criollas. Mm -hmm. um, and and then of course there are people who are experimenting with other grape varieties too and that's beginning to change things but it's a very exciting time and you know we talk about the, the we talk about the you know all the difficulties of making wine in Argentina economically yes sure. but what amazes me is the resilience of this country and its ability to improve the quality of the wines whilst remaining amazing value for money mm -hmm. um, over time uh, with all the difficulty that they, they have with finding glass corks labels you know it's incredibly difficult it's twice as difficult to make wine here as many other places in the world it's not easy and i think in a way perhaps that's why the wines are so good because they're made in adversity mm -hmm. you know the argentines are very sort of stoical about what's going on there so yeah I, th I find it very exciting and that's i talk about this a lot you know when you're, when you're making wine in salta the logistics of making wine in salta mm -hmm. are uh, hello fella yeah. uh, the list is, uh, of making wine in salta are, are very hard and yet you know um, some people say why are some of these wines expensive well because they incur a huge cost mm -hmm. because they're very remote you know you don't have the infrastructure um up in pajagasta you know they're probably borrowing each other's tractors or using horses and i think also the move towards sustainability is very rapid now mm -hmm. um, it's very quick um, and I think that's very, very important for Argentina. Súmate a nuestra comunidad en Instagram. El mercado del Reino Unido es muy importante para Argentina y de esto hablamos en Vinos y Placeres. Filter me about the, the market in England now. The market in England has seen for Argentina es since I guess the late 1990s. Mm -hmm. The the rise in Argentina has been meteoric. You know, mm. it's been like this. Yeah. Um, it's been spectacular. It's been an incredible success story. Mm -hmm. um, in the last two or three years, I think for various reasons like the pandemic, but also um, economically for the UK. The UK is going through a very tough time at the moment. Mm -hmm. We have a cost of living crisis, we have inflation. I know I'm in Argentina talking about <laughs> inflation. I have no right to do that. Yeah, but no. We do have inflation. We've had one or two percent inflation for the last 15 years. Mm -hmm. So we are going through a lot of change. There's a lot of fear in the market. And also um, this government put a, uh, they changed the, the duty system, the tax system on wine which meant that um, wines from the Southern Hemisphere mm -hmm. were proportionately, disproportionately um, uh, uh, penalized for the level of alcohol. So mm -hmm. we've seen taxes on wines of higher alcohol. We're gonna have higher alcohol big here because we have more sun. Um, it's unfair on the Southern Hemisphere because they have to, we now have to pay more tax on the wines. Mm -hmm. And when that happened, we saw, um, in August, it was almost like a January when everybody's running down their stocks from Christmas. Mm -hmm. So we, it's very tough, but I'm positive. I think um, <laughs> hopefully next year we will have a different government and um, we will have a little bit more positive positivity in, in, the, in the market. And of course, Brexit has been a complete disaster mm -hmm. for the UK mm -hmm. um, and for wine. Um, you know, because the UK is a is a major power in in the wine world. Mm. You know, we export more wine from the UK than you do to the rest of the world in yeah. terms of value. Mm -hmm. it, it goes to it goes to Asia and places like that. And there's a lot of expertise in the in the, in the UK. And of course, the UK is a fantastic place to buy wine because you can buy everything. Mm -hmm. We don't really produce much wine ourselves, although that's changing. We are, but we you know we produce enough wine 
probably the same amount of wine that's produced in Tupungato is produced in the UK every year. So it's, it's small and it's growing, but you know. Um, so it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very tough time for the UK. Paul Hobbs told me that uh, Argentina is a Silicon Valley of the wine. For the difference, for the possibilities. Um, yes, I guess there's a lot of change and that change is very rapid. So if that's what you mean, I totally agree. Mm -hmm. um, it also, I think there's a huge amount of diversity and mm -hmm. that's very important. If everybody goes the same way, and the wines start taking the same, tasting the same, I think that would be a great shame. So we have, you know, some very old-fashioned producers like uh, Weinart and Lopez, and it's great that we have them because it's a very different style. Yes. And then, of course, we've got the very modern, we've got the, you know, the rock and roll, the, the, the what I call the, the cool kids mm -hmm. on the block, although they're not so much kids anymore, <laughs> like the Michelini brothers and, um, and you know, the young winemakers. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's tremendously exciting, but I think there's enough room for everybody. There's the more old fashioned styles that are still very popular yes. in, uh, in the UK, for example, because, um, because they fell in love with Malbec 20 years ago and they still like that style. And some of them don't accept the new styles. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I was reading a journalist uh, a little while ago that was saying the new style of Malbec, they call brutalist. <laughs> <laughs> um, because they're much leaner, they're more, you know, more linear, more direct, and yes. quite fluid. Um, <laughs> I like these wines. I think it's a very good direction for Argentina. But not everybody needs to go in that direction. Everyone needs to find their place, yes. I think. Mm -hmm. And also we need to find your place, not just physically, but where you are in the market. What is the name of your company now? Uh, it's Utopia Wines. Utopia. Yeah, so it's based on the word utopia. We find Utop this to be a utopia. It is, it is a utopia. Ut it's a beautiful place. And we play on the word Uco, of course. So a lot of our wines are from the Uco Valley. We don't specialize particularly in the Uco Valley, but a lot of our wineries and a lot of the wines are from the Uco Valley. But we also have wines from Wuhan, from the east of Mendoza, and mm -hmm. in the, in, from La Paz, for example. We're working with Matias Morcos and really concentrating on these, these Criollos. And we are very, very excited about these wines because they're getting better and better and better and uh, if you compare if you compare the pace of change in Malbec and you say that's probably happened over 25 years and then you look at the Criollas and the first Criollas that started coming to the market maybe three years ago mm -hmm. the pace of change in those three years has been the same as the pace of change that Malbec has had in 25 years so I think the, the general knowledge and the general uh, standard and the general intellectual side of winemaking in Argentina is in a very healthy place. Thank you very much. You're very welcome. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Cheers. <laughs>